Ed DeRosa with HRNHQ. Pleased to be joined. A long time coming. Too long. Finally got him on. Chase Sessoms. You know him as the Wolf. He's going away from our picks page, but hopefully not too far from our hearts. Still want to get his uh, handicapping thoughts through the years. And we're going to start with uh, this weekend, Chase, the Alabama Stakes. And I'd say it's uh, feet to the fire. This is a competitive group. It's very competitive. Uh, you know, looking at just speed figures, if I were to take averages when I throw out trouble trips, when I throw out, you know, maybe wet surface, uh, you know, uh, races, I looking at averages, everyone is very close. They're within like one or two kind of, you know, figures uh, or points uh, of each other. And uh, I, I think it's really going to come down to pace and to, and to how the, uh, you know, some possible shenanigans I see happening. <laughs> yeah, th this feels like it could, uh, I don't know if, fall apart necessarily the right word because maybe it's someone who is able to steal it on the front end this is a 10 for a long race mile and a quarter i feel like we go over the top with derby pedigree and the distance in the derby and honestly maybe not enough about pedigree in races like even the belmont and then of course here a mile and a quarter how much of that weighs on you for a race like this where you do actually get the classic distance for a change I think whenever Spites Town Babies started winning long races <laughs> is about when I, I thought, okay, maybe not, maybe it doesn't matter quite as, as much as I think it does. Uh, I mean, I think it's when you start getting into the the marathon distances of like a mile and a half and longer that that you start really having to lean on uh, on pedigree as we kind of see in the Belmont every year. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Spites Town's a great example, and. Uh, I think, too, just in, in this era where the trainers are so precision, laser focused on each next race, five, six, eight, ten weeks after the previous race, right. that they know if that horse, you know, they're not waiting three months to race a horse in this race that they have doubts about a mile and a quarter. That's Absolutely. just kind of my read. Now, occasionally you'll get guys and gals who maybe aren't at the top tier with your Pletchers, Browns, et cetera, that have a once in a lifetime for them horse and they're going to take a shot. And that maybe is one out factor in pedigree, but you know, like chocolate gelato to me. Okay. Rapoli wants to be in these races. I get it. Practical joke, not great routing. 10 furlongs definitely scares me. But in my mind, at the price you're going to get, especially like to me, it's just not as much of a factor with a guy like Todd Pletcher. I agree. I agree. I and I, it's funny that you mentioned chocolate gelato and and Pletcher and Rapoli because <laughs> uh, I you know seeing the fact that chocolate gelato and Gambling Girl uh, are, are both entered for Pletcher and Rapoli um, makes me think that we might see a much hotter pace. Uh, then if you were to just look at it and see uh, one of the Chads randomized as the as the lone early speed, which doing the the pace setup, that's kind of what I saw. Um, but I think, you know, with two Chad Browns and one of them being a deeper closer and the chocolate gelato wanting to come off from the pace, I think we've got dual rabbits possibly. Interesting. Yeah, that's uh, well, and ra randomized is I'm looking at Briss now, but she's also had the fastest rag is in last out and then if you look at just the career best number chocolate gelato factors extremely well now granted that was last year it was at six furlongs and she did come back to win the frisette and then it hasn't gone so well since but there is a fast number to run back to and both of those fast numbers are on the front end so if they're going to give their best shot maybe that does set up for a closer and I thought Julia Shining, she would have been my pick had she drawn into the Oak. She was on the also eligible list. Uh, I was kind of sour on her after some slow, what came back as slow races. As it turns out, this is just a slow group. And consistency wise, I see her as the fastest. It is a long layoff for 10 furlongs. But if she's the third or fourth choice in here, I think we're going to get, I'm going to get the price I want. I took some, I, so weather will put, play a factor because what I'm concerned about is that we see the same kind of uh, track that we saw Wednesday at Saratoga where we have rain the day before. And then it's not every time, but in my mind, it kind of feels ingrained that 
on days after you get weather at Saratoga, when it's drying out, it kind of turns into the the whole Saratoga moving sidewalk and can kind of mm-hmm. move move speed forward. And I'm not sure if I want a horse that's not going to be up in contention, uh, and t- you know, right at the uh, right as they start to enter the lane. I, I want I think I want a horse that's uh, kind of making a little bit of a middle move. And uh, a lot of the clothes, Julie Shining uh, is one that I had in, in consideration. It has showed shown that move before in like a in a maiden special weight back at Keeneland. Um, but I, I ended up going uh, going elsewhere and trying to look for for ones that would be maybe a little bit more more forward than than a deeper closer. Yeah, getting that first jump, uh, so to speak, uh, tougher to catch, uh, reeling them in. Well, uh, we've talked about the two speeds. I gave you the one from way probably way off the pace. I like in Julia Shining. I know already. We're neither of us are keen on wet paint. So who's left? Who you like? Uh, I, I think I'm actually going directly against uh, HRN uh, literature uh, with this pick because uh, okay. the, the word toss was next to it. But I ha- I feel like I got a strong case for it. Um, my top pick's the number nine, Taxed. Uh, okay. For one. Uh, Another I, horse who had, had she drawn in, people would have, I know, would have liked in the Oaks. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And I, I think that people are kind of uh, fading her because of the how she looked in the uh, Indiana Oaks last out. Uh, we have to take into account that she brushed the gate at the start. Um, I think that she's going to sit slightly behind that second wave of horses. So she might not be first run, but she'll be about second run. And I think that she makes that good middle move, that kind of sustained run that where she'll get started early enough to, to come. Uh, she was a winner at nine furlongs in the uh, black eyed Susan and won it going away. And if you look at her, she does her best running with hot to honest fractions uh and being you know able to to kind of stalk that pace from a little bit further back um bayerano makes the trip east it's the only mount that he has i mean of course he doesn't have a ton of connections at saratoga so i wouldn't expect him to pick up a ton of mounts but i i mean if if you take a plane somewhere i, I feel like you you have a decent expectation to get paid yeah Especially, I mean, he's live at Ellis every day, so it's not like, you know, uh, I had nothing better to do. Uh, right. I wouldn't even say the same goes for Brian Hernandez, and I don't, I'm looking now to see uh, if he has any others that day. Uh, you, you know, that's it. So he, him and Raphael are probably on the same plane uh, to New York. I, th- I was disappointed in tax, even at four to five. I definitely thought she was the horse to be at Indiana Oaks. I was there. Um, I, I forget exactly what wagers, but, you know, I, I thought those were the two and I thought tax was a little better. So the gate issue, the trip just wasn't ideal. Defining purpose, though, just ended up being better that day. Now, based on what we've talked about, the pace, I would say that favors taxed a little better in the Alabama, depending on price. I wouldn't necessarily give up on defining purpose. I like a ragazin pattern, pattern a touch better. And after that Indiana race, Kenny said, you know, they'd look at the Cotillion, they'd look at the Alabama, the Cotillion, I think is still five weeks away after this. That she shows up here. Kenny likes to run them. So that's not necessarily a surprise, but they could go for a championship. She has the Ashland to grade one. If she were to win here, could even argue she's the leader of the division. So I like the try. Uh, obviously, at a mile and a quarter, uh, the outside post isn't a huge issue. So, yeah, I, I agree with you in that the Indiana Oaks could show out here. I like defining purpose a little better, uh, but the pace, you know, could be an issue for sure. Uh, all of that is to say we've gone through several horses. We have to make a case against wet paint because I do think she'll be the favorite. I want no part of her at even four to one against this group. Right. I, I mean, with the win in the CCA Oaks, it, it wasn't a remarkable field that that Wet Paint beat. Um, you go back to the Monomoy Girl, where Wet Paint is the you know less than a, a, a dollar favorite, uh, <laughs> and and she loses to to Hoosier Philly. Uh, me being an Oakland guy, it pains me to say, but I feel like the last you know last year specifically, the Kentucky Oaks preps weren't necessarily that strong. Uh, so I think you might have had a horse for course who just kind of got the better of an average field uh, in, in the CCA Oaks. Uh, I also just, you know, if, if I'm right about the bias uh, that I'm perceiving, which I'll be watching through the day to make sure it's still the case, but 
if I'm right about that, then she's going to want to come from way too far back. Like if she hits the the stretch five back, you know, four back at the at, at the top of the lane, I don't think that she she's able to to get up at all. Um, you know, I, I'm a fan of uh, you know Brad Cox and Godolphin. I mean, go Dolphin because that my dolphin is what I like to say. <laughs> um, but I, I I at this price, it's it's a play against every day. Stop Dolphin in this case, right? <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, now I have um, on the opposite end of the spectrum. I I think Sabra Tough and Fireline, they to me are the the two total outsiders. Uh, Sabra Tough would be a, a true shock. Fireline, I guess you can never count out given the connections. Uh, you know, Brown and Castellano need no introduction. But you know, speed wise, you mentioned how tight this group is competitively within a few points. And that race two back was the fastest of hers, and she's by Arrogate, so maybe she's just going to keep getting better. Mile and a quarter, not an issue. But it, it just seems like Fireline, given the connections, might take a little more money than than the paper indicates she should. You know, I I considered Fireline to actually be another overlay that I could maybe start a trifecta with on top with uh, with Taxed. And the reason okay. being, uh, you mentioned it, uh, is that we've all seen this movie uh, way <laughs> too many times. And also, I mean, the horse, I, I feel like, you know, Randomizer is is the rabbit for Fireline. You might see Fireline lay off of it and not be not run the risk of being in the, the first run pack of horses and get sucked into the early pace, especially mm -hmm. if they understand what the tactics are. Um you know, just assuming maybe Chad mentioned something to both jockeys or anything. I don't know. I don't want to say anything. Not Chad, happening. Chad's a known tactician. He'll, he'll map it out. And he, Fireline's going to be the more likely horse to be, to be at the, you know, at the, the top of the stretch, ready, ready to run with the, with the uh, leaders as they kind of come back to him. Um, I playing horses from off the pace and, and some of these races sometimes just kind of feels like a number game. Just how many, how many salmon do I have to unleash to, to actually get upstream? Um, so I, I I probably end up dutching a little bit between um, uh, tax and, and Fireline and probably start some exotics with those two on top. I'm glad you mentioned the try. Not you know obviously I, I tip my hand Fireline not necessarily for me in in that regard and, and we'll see what the price is. I mean maybe she gets overlooked after that disappointing Delaware Oaks where. I remember picking her. I didn't actually didn't think she'd be nine to 10. So that was uh, a surprise, but uh, you know, with the 10 horse field, which, you know, by grade one standards is pretty good these days. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I do think the verticals get overlooked where if you, if you have a thought here at eight or 10 to one, and for me, that might end up being defining purpose of a horse who can, whether it's stick around or in, you know, in the case of fire in line, get up because she's chasing the uncoupled stable mate. Uh, you, you can still do okay. And the second, you know, another opinion you and I both share, if you're willing to toss wet paint completely, uh, well, now all of a sudden you're against a favorite in a 10 horse field. And there's a lot more you can do with that in a try than maybe just saying, oh, well, I played this pick five and I'm trying to beat wet paint. Well, yeah. you still need to be exactly right for other times. Whereas in the try, you don't, I think this is a good race to play vertically, given what you and I have talked about. Definitely. I, I like to play part wheels where, you know, I start with maybe two on top and then I'll wheel in a, a third horse into second. And, and then just however many I think could uh, hang or dink uh, into third. And, um, you know, I, it's one of those things where if you if you feel froggy and you want to put wet paint into second, uh you know, it's, it's a good play and you can wheel it, wheel her into third too. So if she doesn't hit the, hit the board in second, but um, I kind of like the idea of just trying to beat her into third and only using her in the third position and using a horse, like you mentioned, like Julia shining, uh, to get up in second, because they are going to do their best running late. And, uh, those are the kind of horses that you can see get up and, and, you know, miraculously get a piece. Well, I would, uh, I would take a, a miraculous, I'm, I'm trying to think like the longest shot's definitely going to be Sabra Tuff, who, I mean, yeah. she's just not she's just not better than enough of these to even make a case for third. But uh, Sacred Wish, who's the only other one we really haven't mentioned, uh, she was the one who just did get pipped. But she's shown an ability. Um, you know, that Black Eyed Susan, I don't know, that was her worst race of her career. But, you know, 
there's others around that race where uh, she was able to take back a little bit and be in the frame at the end. So to me, depending on her price, I could see maybe trying to sneak her in there and, you know, Johnny V gets back aboard, which is a, is a positive. So uh, yeah, I mean, I think vertically, th this is a race. I mean, I, I'll tell you like Julia shining would be my pick, but mm -hmm. Given the competitive nature and being against the favorite, I'm far more interested in coming up with the right pieces of the puzzle to hit the try than yeah. I am being right on top. I will also 100% have a big, stupid superfecta that might include <laughs> every single horse in third. Um, yeah, it's uh, I like Sacred Wish quite a bit because I do think what she's shown is that she does like two turn routing which when you consider so a lot of these horses coming from new york and everything that's such the big change whenever they go to go to saratoga is that you know there, there's back when they didn't have the wilton shoot which is not really true two turn racing mm -hmm. and they were doing the the nine you know everything was out to nine furlongs it, it was just such a obvious advantage where you had horses who actually liked running two turns as opposed to going you know one turn at, at aqueduct yeah, that that Wilton shoot. Uh, it's interesting. I, the bane sure. of my existence. I, <laughs> I can't believe Wilt Chamberlain lended his name to it. Well, when when the when the money bag arrives, it's hard to say no. There there is uh, a one. There is one Wilton shoot race in this late pick five, which I have not looked at yet. Uh, three other turf races in it. Uh, have you had a chance to look at any of the four? Anything stick out to you? Uh, I, I am also a Brisnet user and was also, uh, uh, minorly inconvenienced by the, mm. <laughs> the, the site maintenance yesterday. So I'm yeah. just now uh, digging into it, uh, uh, for later. So, uh, I, I don't have any, uh, any hard opinions on it yet, unfortunately. Well, I, I have to say just in general, uh, I know Saratoga has been very frustrating, uh, for a lot of people, um, various reasons. The pick five, uh, should not be one of them, even though I haven't. I may have hit one, but it wasn't a big one. But I actually think the prices have been extremely fair in the pick five pools there. I know they go out of their way to say they don't do the, the CRW direct tote thing, 15% takeout. So that's low. Doesn't leave a lot of margin for rebates. Uh, so, so to me, that pool has sort of lived up to the old school. Like if you have a good opinion and can separate, you can make a score. Unfortunately, I have not had the, the good opinion to separate, but you know, I feel like with the Alabama being against the favorite, these pools are huge. Hopefully an opportunity on Saturday. I, I, I'm just, my ADHD, you know, squirrel chasing brain isn't built for, for pick fives. I've decided I just have the, the enough focus for the, uh, for the exact and the, and the tries, but no. yeah, it's the, the payouts have been extremely fair. I agree with you 100%. As a player, uh, very important to, to know, uh, like in poker, there's so much literature and chatter about game selection and finding even the, down to the right table once you pick your game, if the room's big enough. And in racing, that's not discussed enough. And we get, you know, various wagers kind of pushed to that direction over and over again. And, you know, yeah. unfortunately, I do think and I'm a victim of this. So this is a takes one to know one statement, but you know, you feel like, Oh, I got to play the pick five because everyone's playing it. And I was going to say, Oh, I'll play it. Don't get, yeah. me, <laughs> don't get me wrong. But you know, to, to me, the Alabama is man, we're, we're against a favorite. We think maybe a couple of these might be overlays. Uh, and you and I disagree maybe on one or two of the ones we're excited about, but nevertheless, like to me, that screams opportunity vertically and, you know, then all of a sudden you're tying up capital, playing the pick five in race seven, and it's a detriment. So I'm going Outs to be, of, be like, focused on this Alabama. Right. Outside of the couple, you know, like a six furlong two-year-old uh, stakes races that they have to kind of start the meet, um, which the names escape me right now, but I'll just call them the Steve Asmus and yeah, the Skylerville and the... Uh, Vanderbilt? Sanford? Sanford. Yes, the Sanford. Uh, outside of those, we haven't really felt like we haven't really seen just a bunch of just fantastic prices or any just like big balloons kind of mm. graded stakes races. I, I yeah. think this might break the trend. All right, I'm I'm for it. I don't I don't know I don't know if we'll be that big like we saw in the Schuylerville with the first time starter, but uh, I mean, sir, well, forget whatever the winner pays. Maybe it's only fifteen twenty bucks. But I think all three spots could be filled by, you know, that type of horse. Sure. So, 
that would be a bonanza for sure. And with the horizontals, if you can knock wet paint out of it, I mean, that's I it, it definitely uh puts a little uh little spice on that meatball. Absolutely. All right. Well, Chase, sorry it took so long, but hopefully you won't be a stranger. Oh, man, I thank you for for having me and uh I really appreciate uh let me uh finally finally uh hang out, man. Yeah. Uh, no, good good discussion on a very competitive and good Alabama stakes. Uh, you know, I, I, again, I think this group of three-year-old Phillies maybe doesn't stack up generationally. No world beaters here, but can only beat who's in the gate. And uh, I think, you know, the winner of this race stands a good, uh, has, will have a good case to be the leader of the division. So yep. lots to watch. Chase, thanks again. Thank you. All right. That's Chase. I'm Ed. Good luck in the.